All right, the verdict is in for Trump's trial guilty on 34 counts. The Democrats are cheering. The liberals are crying tears of joy saying they finally got him. And in reality, it's them that got got. It's America. It's the American public. That's why we're sitting down with Jim Rickards today. As a former advisor to the CIA and Pentagon, Jim knows his way around politics. He's also a New York lawyer practicing for over 40 years, so he knows the New York law system. Add it up, and he's the most qualified man to get you caught up with what's happening in the Trump trial with the verdict and what this means for the 2024 election. Jim, thank you so much for sitting down with us today on short notice. Let's get caught up here. What is your take on the Trump verdict? Sure, Matt. Uh, glad, glad to do that. You know, at uh, uh, our newsletter, Strategic Intelligence, and, and our many other uh, newsletters, we always pride ourselves on staying ahead of the curve. We don't just tell you, we don't tell you what just happened. We tell you what's going to happen. And obviously that's more valuable uh, to investors. But this is, uh, you're right, this topic is in the breaking news category where a lot of people are out there and, and we want to stay on top of it for our readers uh, as well. Um, this verdict has a, a, a huge legal aspect and a huge political aspect. Let's kind of take those one at a time. I'll start with the uh, uh, with the legal aspect first, not get too bogged down. Um, the one one point I want to make, um, the, yeah, 34 felony convictions, 34 separate felonies. Now, this was uh, a little bit of what they call uh, uh, charge stacking. It was really just one bookkeeping violation, which wasn't even a violation. I'll get into that. But, you know, you multiply, if there were 30, if you talk to 34 people, they somehow they turn into 34 uh, conspiracy counts. But, um, uh, yeah, the, the but their felony is punishable by four years in prison each. Uh, if you want to sentence uh, Donald Trump to you know four times, uh, four times thirty four, that's uh, I think one hundred thirty six um, years in prison. Uh, that is not impossible, unlikely, by the way. But that's kind of what we're up against. Um, one thing before we kind of jump into the the details, Matt. One thing I, I want to one point I want to make. I want to read a few excerpts from something we sent to our readers in October of 2023. Eight months ago in our okay. newsletter, Strategic Intelligence, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase. Uh, we, uh, uh, Our subscribers can go to the archives and find it's the October 2023 issue of Strategic Intelligence. Uh, we said the following, the election won't be decided in November 2024. It's being decided now. Again, we wrote this eight months ago. Trump is highly likely to be convicted. Uh, because the jurisdictions were carefully selected by Democrat prosecutors. Trump could be in an orange jumpsuit behind bars in November 2024 and still be elected president. Uh, there's no constitutional prohibition against that. So the, the important point is you, you can literally be in jail behind bars and still be elected president. That is not a, not a disqualification. Um, and I said that uh, that appears likely to me. Well, that's playing out uh, exactly as we uh, we predicted. Um, I said none of the possible defenses or defective charges may matter. There are lots of defenses. The charges were a complete joke. Uh, but Trump's lawfare opponents among the prosecutors carefully selected the venues to maximize the likelihood of a conviction. And of course, they got the conviction. Uh, and I said the venues were chosen to ensure anti-Trump juries and they certainly got that. Um, so, uh, and then just to summarize, this is a longer excerpt, but I'm just picking a few uh, highlights. I said, the 2024 presidential election may come down to a convicted felon behind bars on the Republican side. The point of reciting that, Matt, is just to say, we told our readers this was going to happen eight months ago. Uh, it's a very unfortunate result. It's a sad day for America. It's a very... As a lawyer, in addition to um, an analyst, very, uh, very unhappy with the result. But our, our job is not to do happy talk. Our job is not to tell you what already happened. Our job is to tell you what's going to happen. And eight months ago, when this was barely on the radar screen, pre people were not talking about this particular outcome. We said to readers that that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, that is exactly what did happen. So in kind of uh, keeping with this uh, idea of staying ahead of the curve. Let's talk about what's next in the judicial process. Again, I want to, you can put on CNN or MSNBC or Fox or any other channel to 
find out, you know, they'll, they'll be dissecting, you know, what, what happened in the trial, et cetera. I'm not saying that's not important, but, but we've always prided ourselves on, on looking ahead and telling people what's going to happen next. So this case will um, certainly be appealed. Um, and uh, I think it's important. I just want to spend a minute on the New York state court system because the name are completely different than what people expect. I am a, a New York lawyer. Um, so what most people think of the Supreme Court as being the highest court in, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States or maybe the Supreme Court of a state of, uh, I don't know, Iowa, New Jersey or whatever. Um, in New York, the Supreme Court is the lowest court. They just have a funny name system. So the Supreme Court is the lowest court. So that's the trial court. Usually you think of a trial court and then you appeal up to the Supreme Court. In New York, the trial court where Trump is just convicted is called the Supreme Court. Okay, so where do you go for appeals? Do you go to the Court of Appeals? No. New York has a funny name called the Appellate Division, uh, and it's broken into numeric divisions, first division, second division, et cetera. Uh, Manhattan, where Trump was convicted, is the first division. That's actually where I was sworn in. Uh, the courthouse is a little, you know, it's kind of a cute old, uh, almost neocolonial building on uh I think it's around 24th Street, right off Madison Square, um, not Madison Square Garden, but the old Madison Square uh, down around 24th, uh, 24th and Madison. But uh, yeah, you can walk right past it and not even know it's there, but that is the uh, first appellate division. So that's where this appeal will go. And then if you um, uh, want to take it further to what most people consider the Supreme Court in New York, that's called the Court of Appeals. So if you hear the, the appellate division, that's where the appeal is going. Uh, if it gets to the New York State highest level court, that's called the Court of Appeal. So a little bit of a confusing name system, but I just wanted to spell that out for our viewers. And so just a could, quick question, uh, since you know the insides of this, are any of those courts level-headed? Uh, the answer is yes, fortunately. And I do expect this to be appealed. I'll talk about specifically why, but here's the okay. thing with appellate courts that people don't understand. When you appeal a case like this, you, you have a, you had a trial, you got a verdict. It was a miscarriage of justice, but the verdict is in. Um, when you appeal, you don't do the trial over. Uh, there are no witnesses. There are no exhibits at the appellate level. It's pure points of law. So when you get to the uh, appellate division, this, the, the first division uh, on this appeal, there's not going to be any Stormy Daniels. There's not going to be any Michael Cohen. There's not going to be any... Uh, there'd be no witnesses, no exhibits, no discussion of pornographic films or anything of the kind. It's strictly points of law, number one. Number two, there's a bench. Uh, I don't know exactly how many uh, judges will be on the bench, but um, you know, it could be three or more. It could be the entire first division. So it's it's lawyers only arguing points of law before a panel of judges. No witnesses, no exhibits, no Stormy Daniels. That's over. This is just lawyers talking to judges uh, about the law, um, which is good for Trump because um, the law very much favors uh, favors him. And now I'll go through the some of the points of appeal uh, in, in a minute, but but here's the point: at the appellate level, these judges uh, are focused on two things. Number one, they want to get the law right. They're not there to judge whether Michael Cohen was a liar or Stormy Daniels was credible or whether her testimony about the bedroom antics were uh, relevant. That's not their job. They just want to get the law right, number one. Number two, an appellate court judge's greatest concern, other than the law itself, is getting overruled. Um, you, Because, you know, if you're on the if you're in the uh, appellate division, you hope maybe someday you'll be appointed to the Court of Appeals, which, as I mentioned, is the highest court in New York. Well, judges who get overruled a lot, or more than even once or twice, don't get those. They don't get those appointments. They don't get the promotion. In other words, so they really care about the law, and they really care about not being overruled. So, if you're in the uh, appellate division, the first division, as I mentioned, you're sitting there saying, "Hey, I better get this right because I don't want the Court of Appeals." to overrule me. So they're very, as, as I said, they're completely focused on the law, not the facts of the case. And they're in the backs of their minds. They're saying, I don't want to get overruled by a higher court. So I better get this right. That's all good news for Trump because Trump should win on, on the law. Uh, what happened at the trial court was is saying a joke is, you know, maybe not strong enough. It was uh, a complete, uh, complete miscarriage of justice. So, um, I don't want to dwell on that. It was a farce. It's over. 
uh, but let's get to the uh, to the appellate division. So here are some of the reasons why Trump's conviction will be reversed on appeal. Number one, the trial judge violated the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution with the gag order. I mean, the gag order gives you free speech. Now, gag orders are not unusual. I've been involved in some major litigation where the judge put a gag order, kind of a non-disclosure order, if you want to think of it that way. Gag order is, is like the popular version of it. But he applied it to everybody, the prosecution, the defense, or the, the plaintiff and the defense, uh, all the all the, uh, all the the lawyers, uh, all the witnesses, basically told everybody, you can't talk about this. And I've, as I say, I've been involved in some big cases. I'm not going to talk about them now because, uh, um, because we had those gag orders. But the point is, they applied to everybody. And they were narrowly limited to the facts of the case. I mean, I had one where, again, I'm not going to mention the name, but one of the biggest investment managers in the world. And I had to sit and plow through 5,000 emails. I was an expert witness in the case, go through 5,000 emails, looking for uh, things that would, would help uh, help our client. Uh, so they're not unusual. But what was unusual and what's probably unconstitutional is, one, it was applied to Trump only. Nobody told Michael Cohen to shut up. Nobody told Stormy Daniels to shut up. Nobody told anybody else in the case they couldn't talk about it. They just told Trump, number one. And number two, there were a lot of things that were uh, – Trump's running for president. I mean, he's not just some, you know, uh, he's not Robert De Niro, you know, kind of mouthing off in the street. He is running for president. He's in the middle of a campaign. Trump wanted to talk about Judge Mercon, Judge, Judge Juan Mercon, by the way, was the presiding judge in this trial. His daughter is a major fundraiser uh, and, and a political operative for the Biden campaign. She makes millions of dollars personally, not just raising for the camp for the Biden campaign, but makes millions of dollars personally um, if Trump is damaged in any way. I can't think of a more clear and, and by the way, the judge gave contributions to Biden. These are total conflicts of interest. The first thing the judge is supposed to do is recuse himself, say, you know, uh, interesting, but I can't I can't uh, preside in this case because you know, my daughter's making millions of dollars bashing Trump. I can't be a, a neutral judge. The judge did not recuse himself, and he told Trump that Trump couldn't talk about the daughter. Now, he he dressed it up as, you know, um, we don't want to uh, jeopardize the families, et cetera. Well, her, her role is well known. It's on the Internet. I mean, so you're not jeopardizing the family. What you're doing is telling the truth, and the judge said he couldn't do that. So that's a violation of the First Amendment, um, number one, because it was selective and it was not relevant to the case at hand. So the judge also violated the Fifth Amendment. The, well, the Fifth Amendment says that nobody shall be tried for a major offense unless there's an indictment which states with specificity the causes of the complaint. Now, Trump was indicted. They did go to a grand jury. But the, um, but the, the contents of the indictment had nothing to do with the crime that was alleged. These were two expired misdemeanor charges um, when I say expire, they were past the statute of limitations. Well, how do you elevate two misdemeanors, if that's what they were even, how do you elevate two misdemeanors past the statute of limitations into 34 felonies where the statute of limitations isn't over yet? Well, the way that the way they did it, this is Alvin Bragg, but I mean, Alvin Bragg is kind of a dope, but what they did, they got a top lawyer at the Justice Department in Washington, the number three official in the Department of Justice came was sent to new york and signed up with bragg's office to conduct the case bragg alvin bragg was not smart enough or capable enough to run this trial but this guy uh from uh, from washington was and he he actually conducted the trial um but uh uh they th in order to get the misdemeanors turned into felonies etc you had to find another crime so these bookkeeping entries were in pursuance of or conspiracy to commit another crime, which was a felony, which was um, not past the statute of limitations, et cetera. They never said what the crime was. To this day, right now, now, as we speak, I can't tell you what the crime was. The, the indictment didn't say what the crime was, et cetera. So that violates the Fifth Amendment because there was an indictment, but didn't spell out the actual charge, which was this other mystery crime uh, that uh, that people are guessing. I can guess. Uh, all the commentators are guessing, but no one actually knows. It wasn't in the jury instructions, by the way. The, the judge told the jury, um, you don't have to agree on what the ultimate crime was. Well, I'm sorry. The, the New York state law requires unanimity. You need a unanimous 
jury verdict, <clears throat> pardon me, jury verdict, 12 out of 12 have to agree. The judge said, you don't have to agree. You know, four of you think one thing, two of you think something else, whatever. That's fine. Well, I'm sorry, that violates the unanimity uh, requirement. Um, the judge violated the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment says, and I'll quote in part, uh, the defendant, quote, has the right to be informed of the nature and the cause of the accusation. Again, he wasn't informed. How do you defend a client if you don't know what the charge is? Well, that's what they did. They didn't spell out the charge. They had these bookkeeping entries, but they, they had to be bootstrapped onto something else, and they never said what the something else was. Um, and um, the Sixth Amendment also says the defendant has the right to have, quote, process for obtaining witnesses in his favor. Well, the most powerful witness that the defense, the Trump's defense wanted to call was the former head of the Federal Election Commission, because Again, we're guessing a little bit, but when you say, well, what was the violation that bootstrapped these expired misdemeanors into felonies? Well, one of them was a violation of federal election law that somehow paying the hush money. By the way, the hush money is kind of a pejorative phrase. It's a non-disclosure agreement. I'm, in my career, I did dozens of these. And, you know, you, somebody complains in the workplace, um, you sit down, you hash it out, you you give them $100,000, they sign a non-disclosure agreement, everyone parts ways. Nobody talks about it. We did those things all the time. And so does everybody. I didn't, I never had any porn actresses, but you know, I had my, uh, they were, they were always messy cases, but you do it all the time. And so does every company in America. Uh, and Trump's business was not any different in that respect. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, somehow this was, uh, 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 you know, turned into a crime, but it was only because of this other crime violation of the election law. Well, Trump's team wanted to call the head of the Federal Election Commission to say, no, this, there's nothing wrong with what he did. Paying, uh, again, call it hush money, but paying an amount to get a non-disclosure agreement, even if you're running for something. Maybe you're running for something, and maybe it's better for your campaign if this doesn't become front page news. Okay. But that's not a campaign expenditure. It's something you would do anyway for business reasons, for family reasons, for personal reasons, there are lots of reasons. Not, you know, if you take an Uber to a campaign event, is that a campaign expenditure? Well, not really, you gotta get around. So um, so that was, a, uh, that was a violation of the Sixth Amendment. And then finally, there's the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, because the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, which I mentioned originally at the time of the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government. It did not apply to state governments and this was a state case but the 14th amendment does that the 14th amendment says due process of law meaning all the other things i mentioned do apply to the states so even though this was you know in in 1787 it was a federal constitution it did not originally apply to the states it did apply to the federal government but the 14th amendment after the civil war because of states abuses you know starting with slavery um, did apply. So so all everything everything I just mentioned does apply to the state of New York. So you got the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment. I think four constitutional law violations is enough to get this thing reversed. But notice I was talking about the law, not the facts. Uh, and that's what appellate courts do. And I think they'll zero in on that. By the way, there's there's a long list of other um other uh, violations, other um, cons both constitutional violations, procedural violations, et cetera. So I, I don't, don't want to go down the whole list, but there, think of those as the big four. Um, one other uh, point, Matt, which um, was raised by uh, by Alan Dershowitz, but I this is my experience also. When I was preparing for trials, and I, I'm not a, a litigator, but I was general counsel of a number of Wall Street firms and hedge funds, and we I, I hired some of the absolute finest best most famous litigators in the country certainly in the you know in the in the in the late 20th century and early 21st century um and i don't have to mention all the names but they're, they're they're household names so i worked with the best of the best what we always did preparing for a trial we did whatever we were going to do but we always hired a top-notch appellate lawyer in other words you hope to win the case you're going to do your best and you hope to win the case but you know that you might lose that's just being realistic and you want to get ready for the appeal you don't wait until you lose the case and then say, oh, gee, what's our appeal going to be? You hire the appellate lawyer on day one. The appellate lawyer sits through the whole trial. He's not interviewing. He's not examining any witnesses or doing cross-examination or anything else. 
he, he or she is just sitting there, in effect, taking notes, saying what mistakes are being made along the way, what uh, motions have been denied, what witnesses we're not allowed to call, uh, what testimony was allowed in that should not have been allowed in, et cetera. In other words, you're creating the appellate record so that when you, if you lose, you, you're trying to win, but if you lose, you're good to go. You, you Now your appellate lawyer takes over. Trial lawyers don't do appellate work typically they're appellate specialists and Dershowitz is one of them by the way who Dershowitz you know is famous for the Von Bulow case he was not the trial lawyer in the in the Von Bulow case uh, there was a guy who gave his wife the the allegedly the, the dose of uh insulin that put her into a, a long-term coma uh but um uh he did the appellate work he argued that case in front of the Rhode Island Rhode Island Supreme Court and got the conviction reversed and the guy who did the second trial and got Von Bulow acquitted was my good friend again, top litigator uh, that I worked with for uh, for decades. So um, the now what Dershowitz is saying is that Trump's team <clears throat> did not do a good job of getting ready for the appeal stage. Now I just outlined four grounds for appeal, constitutional grounds. There are many others, but there's more they could have done. So I don't want to nitpick Alan Dershowitz. He's a, a Harvard Law School professor emeritus, uh, one of the top appellate lawyers in history. But uh, it, it's an interesting point. Um, he may be right about that, but uh, I think the record here is so bad that even, um, you know, uh, any appellate lawyer could step into the situation and, and make a good case. So I would expect this conviction to be reversed. Now, here's the problem. It won't be reversed before the election. It's possible, but very unlikely. Uh, you got to, first of all, we still have to wrap up the trial. We haven't had the sentence. So the sentencing is July 11th. I'll come back to that. Uh, but we haven't even had the sentencing stage, number one. Uh, two, uh, you actually have to file notice of appeal. There's a certain time limit to do that, but um, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's usually 21 days or 30 days, so that'll take time. Then you have to get, uh, you have to write your brief, um, your appellate brief. You have to prepare your arguments. You got to get on the court calendar. You got to actually make submit the briefs, make the argument. And then the court has to take time to make a decision and issue a decision. And then who knows, you might want to take it beyond that to the uh, to the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in the state of New York. That's all going to take time. It would be very surprising if it got done before November 5th. So Trump's going to have to wear this you know, convicted felon badge, which is what the Democrats really wanted. I mean, they don't care if Trump wins this case in the end. They don't really care if Trump's in jail or not. What they want to do what they do care about is winning the election. And that just means making Trump look as bad as possible, as quickly as possible, regardless of the outcome. That's a disgrace. That's that's That violates legal ethics, uh, in my view, the Code of Professional Responsibility uh, and a lot else. But the judge doesn't care. I mean, Judge Mercon at the trial court level just, just doesn't care. So uh, so with that, Matt, the, the legalities are, well, we can talk about the sentencing if you want. Um, I think that's important. Uh, but the case will be appealed. It's very likely to be reversed. The verdict is very likely to be reversed on appeal. Uh, there's a process for that, lots of grounds, but it won't be done before Election Day. Yeah. And you can see it. I mean, if the Democrats in this in lawfare, which you've been covering now for, for a long time and just saying this is what they're doing to try and get Trump, you can see it. I mean, I see it just in the last day. And we're, we're within 24 hours of the verdict coming out, but I've seen it with, right. you know, you have liberal friends or your Democrats or whatever, they are, they are very happy. They're excited. They're like, they got him. Yeah. That's the type of people that they want to like, it's some of these, well, those are, those are probably far left leaning, but they want to get some of these middle of the bell curve people to be like, Oh, he, he's kind of bad. They're not going to pay attention to any right. of these facts that, you know, very well. It's right. just kind of like a shot across the bow from the Democrats. So what if we switch, not switch gears, but talking a little bit more about lawfare, this is just one piece of what they've been trying to do, right? They're trying to get him off the ballots. They're doing, you know, like they're they're trying all these different things that have nothing to do with a vote. They're just trying to make him look bad. Um, how is that going to impact the election? And are well, there other things that could be coming? Yeah, uh, at this point, after because uh, this really started in 2015, you know, when Trump came down the escalator in Trump Tower and said he was running. That's when it all began. That's when Hillary Clinton. Uh, Started the uh, the Russian di the dossier and the the uh, hiring of Christopher Steele, you know, kind of a washed up uh, MI six Moscow bureau chief um, who just you know created this complete uh, fabrication of lies. The Russia hoax 
you know, they tried to damage Trump in the election, didn't work, he wins, but paralyzed his administration for three years. We don't need to go through all that. I think our, our readers know, but my, my point is that they don't quit. They don't stop. So yeah, con uh, Trump convicted on 34 felonies. Okay, that's score one for the for the Biden team, score one for the Democrat team. But don't think for a minute they've given up. They're not going to stop until Trump's like bankrupt, behind bars, disgraced. They're, they're just not going to quit. So to your point, Matt, let's go down the, the timeline a little bit because this is really our specialty, which is looking forward. So the next thing that's going to happen is uh, the sentencing is July 11th. Um, now, interestingly, the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, which is going to nominate Trump for president of the United States, is July 15th. Uh, so the sentencing is four, four days before the uh, nom before the nominating convention. That is no coincidence. The judge knew exactly what he was doing. He said, we're going to slam this guy with some kind of sentence. I'll talk about that in a minute before he gets to Milwaukee. So if, when he's standing up on the stage, if he's even allowed to go, by the way, again, we'll come back to that. He'll be not just a convicted felon, but he'll have some sentence hanging over his head, et cetera. So uh, the, again, that's, you would think that the conviction would be enough, but no, it's not enough. Let's use the sentencing in a lawfare sense as a political tool. It could have been done at the end of July. It could have been done in August, but no, let's do it four days before the convention um, as one more shot across the bow. Um, so what will the sentence be? Well, it could be, uh, as I mentioned, 136 years in jail. Uh, that's very unlikely, but that's just, just to set the stage a little bit, you know, four times... Uh, four times uh, 34 uh, in terms of years uh, in jail. By the way, we're talking about state prisons. We're not talking about federal prisons. So you're talking about Rikers Island, which is a hellhole, um, you know, uh, Sing Sing, Attica, I don't, I don't know the, uh, down in Mora, I don't know all the, the New York prisons uh, that are still in business, but that's, that's what we're talking about, which is far, far uh, more, um, uh, just, you know, disgusting rats running around and all that. The federal prison system is, they're not country clubs. I've been to some, but uh, they are, uh, they are a little better. Um, so uh, my estimate is, because I've heard some analysts say, okay, they, so they, they got the 34 felony convictions, they accomplished their goal. So the judge is going to go easy on the sentencing pending appeal. And, and this is up to the judge. The judge can send you right to jail. Or he can leave you out pending appeal, and the appeal will take months, <clears throat> possibly longer, as I described. Um, he's like, like sort of prove their point, so they'll they'll just let Trump, you know, run his campaign uh, pending appeal. I don't think so. Um, the judge has uh, shown no restraint, no sense of ethics, no sense of uh, judicial temperament. He's a Trump hater through and through. That's evident, not just from his donations and his daughter's activities, but from uh, the rulings in the case in, in the trial itself. I don't. Why is the judge suddenly going to change his stripes? Why is he going to be a nice guy at the sentencing after he was a total uh, uh, disgrace through the entire trial? So uh, it doesn't mean he'll send Trump to jail, although he could. So don't don't rule that out. If 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 Trump gets sentenced to, you know, a year in jail, the, uh, and go to Rikers pending appeal, don't be surprised. That could very well happen. What may be more likely is something uh, the equivalent of house arrest um meaning uh you know you're on probation pending appeal uh well probation is not uh you know checking in with the guy once a month you have a probation officer in new york there's a whole probation office if trump is allowed to go to florida he would have to coordinate with the probation officer in florida so he might be, uh, and Mar-a-Lago is his, his primary residence. He does have a place in Trump Tower, but Mar-a-Lago is, he, he moved to Florida a couple of years ago as a resident of Florida. Um, but so, but Trump could be confined to Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago has walls. It's a huge estate. I'm sure you've seen pictures of it. Uh, it could be kind of a prison for Trump. So the, the judge could say, okay, you don't have to go to jail, but you're kind of under house arrest. You're in Mar-a-Lago. You have to report to your probation officer in Florida uh, once a week, doesn't have to be once a month, could be once a week. Uh, you're subjected to drug tests, you're subjected to body searches. Uh, it's a very humiliating experience, you know, is the flight risk? Uh, I don't know, just get a private jet, a big one. Uh, maybe put an ankle bracelet on them. I mean, I, I don't know exactly what all the details will be, but I do know that I don't, I don't think the Trump's, I, sorry, I don't think the judge, Judge McConnell is going to say, okay, you do your thing, run for president, whatever, pending appeal we'll deal with the sentencing later 
Uh, I think I expect that uh, at worst, he could be sent to prison. Don't rule it out. Uh, at best, it'll be some kind of house arrest. But what does that mean? It means no rallies. You know, you saw that rally in Wildwood, New Jersey, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, estimates vary, but fifty to eighty thousand people on the beach. By the way, that's that's my uh, original hometown. I, I I grew up, went to high school in Cape May, New Jersey, which is right next to Wildwood. I was a circulation manager for a Philadelphia newspaper. I know every back alley in Wildwood. Uh, yeah, they had eighty thousand people on the beach down there. Uh, well, you won't. You won't see that. It might prevent him from going to the convention. That was that's a kind of a rally. That's all conventions really are these days. Um, so no Trump at the convention, no Trump rallies, uh, no barnstorming, and you know key states. You know we, we know what they are: Michigan, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, you know Georgia, Arizona, a few other states that are critical to the election, uh, and um, you know maybe continue some version of the gag order. So, so you could really, uh, and Trump's like a caged animal. I mean, Trump, Trump's just full of energy. He gets energized by adversity. He loves these rallies. You, you won't let Trump be Trump. So, I would say worst case, you could see a prison sentence. But even best case, something like house arrest will take him off the campaign trail. Uh, yeah. And this could be the could be the rest of the campaign. So, do you think this was effective? Do you think this? helps or hurts trump because this is like this is getting him all sorts of coverage and then you know there's the if intelligence if a wave of intelligence goes over america they would realize this is a sham and it's the deep state democrats whatever at work here do you think this helps trump or hurts him i think it, it i think it helps him overall in terms of in terms of now, now we're now we're switching from law to politics uh yeah i think he will be elected president i've said that for a while I didn't think it was going to be, it might be close in terms of popular, but I mean, Biden could actually win the popular, but it doesn't matter. The popular vote in a U.S. presidential election doesn't matter. What matters are the state votes and the electoral votes. And Trump is leading in seven out of seven uh, swing states, seven out of seven, plus the national polls, which he's never done before, plus the betting odds. Uh, that was before this verdict. After this verdict, I expect Trump's margins to increase. The fundraising is off the chart. I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners know that the uh, uh, you know, Donald J. Donald J. Com is his main authorized website. You can volunteer, but you can also make contributions. Um, it's run by something called uh, I think Win Red, you know, or Red Win or something like that. But but it, it Donald J. Trump Donald J. Trump Com is the campaign website. Um, it crashed yesterday. So many millions of Americans were logging on to give money to Trump. Whether it was, you know, some guys gave a million bucks, uh, other people gave 25 bucks, that's fine. All contributions welcome. But my point is, so, so many people did that, they crashed the website. And by the way, these are high capacity websites. It's not like a, a high school science project. I mean, they were they were ready for massive volumes, but it, it, it overwhelmed even that anticipation. So the fundraising is through the roof. Um, the people are volunteering. Um, independents are swinging to Trump. Um, one analyst made the point, I think it was a good one. Yeah, African-Americans were already swinging to Trump in ways that would pretty much guarantee that Biden would lose. But uh, who who has sort of more reason for grievance against the justice system than African-Americans? At least a lot of them are dealing with uh, you know crime in their neighborhoods and uh, the justice system not doing its job or um, you know, various kinds of biases, et cetera. So they actually have a lot of, uh, might have more sympathy for someone wrongfully convicted than even everyday Americans, even though we all uh, kind of find this appalling. So uh, so Trump's uh, standing among African-Americans, Hispanic Americans, young people who kind of don't trust the government anyway because of the whole COVID experience and a lot else. And then certainly um, uh, older Americans who have seen, uh, you know, thought they lived in a country that had a rule of law and have learned the hard way that that's not true, at least not in Judge McConnell's courtroom. So from a fundraising point of view, support point of view, demographic point of view, this is all going to help Trump. Uh, and um, he will he actually will be appear a very sympathetic figure. I wouldn't want to be stuck in my house for the next four months. But if he were by a court order, uh, it wouldn't be difficult for the surrogates, um, you know, Larry Trump, uh, Donald Trump Jr., um, whomever he picks for vice president, you know, and, and lots of others. They're already out there. Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, uh, Doug Burgum, um, 
uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, they're all out there supporting Trump. So I, my expectation would be that uh, it, it was certainly a big deal. Not, I'm not downplaying it one bit, but I would say it would help Trump in the polls, massive boost for the fundraising. And Biden still has nothing to offer. I, mean, I don't want to turn this into a broad-based political discussion, but uh, Trump's convicted. Okay, does that change inflation? Does that change the war in Ukraine? Does that change the war in Gaza? Does that change the open border? Does that change crime in the streets? Does that change the price of gas at the pump? All the things that Americans actually care about, if you ask Americans, none of those things have changed. They all disfavor Biden. They all favor Trump because people remember the Trump years. We didn't have any of these problems. There were always issues, but none of the ones I mentioned. So, um, yeah, I think Trump's on his way to a landslide victory. Yeah, I think for the Trump faithful and the people that see the 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 swamp and the system and how it works, this is just a rallying cry because they're like they know the system is is unjust and they're like this is just a smoking gun for it. Do you think there's anything that could change in the narrative for like the mainstream, like a mainstream American, not left or right, that would make this obvious that it's a sham? Like I know I'm seeing, you know, just in the last couple hours, right? It's like oh, well, this is kind of the same as. As Bill Clinton, or this is kind of the same as that. Are there is there something that could easily show this to a, a middle seat sitting American that's like this is a sham? It's so yeah, obvious. I think, yeah, that's right. I think it speaks for itself. Now, look, you, you can get you can get all opinions across the spectrum, but people who say, uh, "Oh, this is just like impeaching Bill Clinton," which is not, by the way. I mean, we don't have to rehash the the impeachment debate, but uh, uh, at least there was a crime there. I mean, Bill Clinton was disbarred; he was impeached. Uh, so. Uh, no, it's not just like that. This is um, this is such an egregious miscarriage of justice. I think. So let's talk about the the independent in the middle of American. There aren't very many of them left, by the way. So yeah. when you hear people say, oh, "This is just like okay, fine," you're a Biden supporter. You don't care that he's, you know, uh, well over eighty. But it's not just about being eighty. He's he's uh, um, he's got dementia. He's mentally defective. He can't speak. He can't walk. They, they they won't let him out. They can't let him out because every time he does, he starts talking about, uh, you know, what his father told him, which his father never told him because all those stories are lies. Uh, how he was appointed to the Navy Academy, which he wasn't. How he was going to play football for Navy, which was not true. How he was a football star at Delaware, which is not true. How he was top of his law school class, not true. I mean, the guy's just, you know, when he has a coherent thought, it's a lie. And then when he has to deal with policy, he can't have a coherent thought. That doesn't change. So, um, so, uh, so the Democrats have their their hands full of that. But if you like Biden, you like Biden. Okay, you're not going to suddenly swing to Trump because there was a miscarriage of justice. So those people don't matter. When I say they don't matter, they're they're already locked in. They're just locked in. So nothing's going to. They'll, they'll rationalize this. You can just put it on MSNBC if you want to hear all the rationalizations. But um, it's not going to matter. What does matter uh, are the the hardcore Trump supporters and the independents. I think for the average independent, uh, they're going to say, hey, you know what? If they can do this to Trump, they can do this to me or you or anybody else. That uh, America is not America. The justice system is not just. Uh, they can target you. This is much more like the Soviet Union. <laughs> but when I say the Soviet Union, I mean the Soviet Union. I mean Stalin. I'm not talking about Russia today. That's a whole other subject. Um, I was in graduate school in international relations in the 1970s at the absolute height of the Cold War when the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union. And we had to study it. I mean, it was like, yeah, it's a, a dictatorship. They put people in uh, you know, Siberia and they shoot people in the head and they do all kinds of things. But they actually had, they had a written constitution. They had a court system. They had rules of civil and criminal procedure. And believe it or not, I had a textbook on the Soviet legal system. It sounds like an uh, oxymoron, but there was a Soviet legal system. I studied it. Now, the whole thing was a sham in the sense that, yeah, we have lawyers, courts, and judges, but it's all rigged. And if we identify you as an enemy of the state, we're going to come up with some charges. We're going to convict you, send you to Siberia. It has the appearance of a judicial process, but it was actually political persecution. That's what the U.S. has become. We have the we have courts, we have you know appellate procedures, all the things we talked about on this call. But um, but when you target somebody, when it's no longer about you know a guy pulls out a, a gun and shoots some people and you arrest them and you're on trial for murder or assault or whatever, this is targeting trumped up charges, no pun intended. Um, you know, breaking every rule in the book, violating the constitution. That's what the Soviet legal system was like, and that's what we have today. And this is where I think. 
even you know kind of independent on the fence americans will see it for what it is and swing in trump's direction as far as the trump supporters you know if you're a trump supporter you're a trump supporter there's nothing that happened that's going to make you more of a trump supporter you're already outraged and now maybe you're a little more outraged but where it will have an effect is turnout uh trump's leading in every poll we talked about that okay but um polls have their own you know uh margin of errors inaccuracy etc and what ha what could go wrong or put differently what uh what happens to surprise pollsters where they have here's what we think is going to happen and it turns out different the answer is turnout uh turnout if it's different than the estimates can be a huge victory for somebody or a surprise loss in this case i would expect turnout to be much higher than projected because People are like, yeah, yeah, I support Trump. I like Trump, you know, et cetera. This was a miscarriage. You can miscarriage of justice. You can say all those things. But if you don't, you know, Chris, voting early is the thing now. But if, if you know, metaphorically, you wake up on election day, you're like, eh, I want to watch a baseball game and have a cold beer. Okay, you're not helping the cause. Um, and I do think that people say, no, I got to get off my butt and go down and vote because this is going too far. This is too dangerous. So I do think Trump will be aided by the turnout, even among people who today are his supporters. Yeah, it's a it's a scary situation for Americans, and I do agree. I think it's emotionally charging that you can see the justice system this uh, this horrible and and up close and personal. So I think that'll get some some butts yeah. off the seats. Jim, um, just sort of last words here. Anything else we should be looking forward to in between now and the election? We got, I mean. Here at Paradigm Press, we're going to be covering this for the next sure. five months, heavy duty. Yep. This is just week over week stuff. Anything else everyone needs to know at home, whether it's related um, to the Trump verdict or not? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're again, we pride ourselves on staying over the, the ahead of the curve. I made the point that uh, everything that happened yesterday or in recent days, we told you about eight months ago. We, we said this was going to happen now. So our job is to just kind of keep leaning forward. So a couple of things. There's a case pending in the United States Supreme Court right now. It's already been briefed and argued. We're just waiting it for a decision. The decision will come out the last week of June. I don't know the exact day, but maybe June 22nd or 23rd. So not that far away. This is the immunity case. Uh, and this comes out of the January 6th prosecution. Remember, we just concluded this New York trial. Trump has three more criminal cases pending. Uh, one in Washington, D.C. on the January 6th so-called insurrection one in Palm Beach, Florida, on the classified documents case, and one in Fulton County, Georgia, with this uh, Fonnie Willis, which has turned into a complete farce. But and we don't have time to kind of go into all those cases. But one of the defenses raised in the January 6th case, which is the special prosecutor, Jack Smith, it's a federal case in D.C., which is very unfriendly in terms of uh, jury selection, is that presidents have immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts. And Trump was president on January 6, 2021. Biden wasn't sworn in until January 20th, 20, uh, 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 20, uh, 2021. So Trump was actually president on uh, on January 6. And um, so whatever he did, and is highly debatable, has been misportrayed. He actually said, we want, we want everyone to be peaceful. And they told people to leave the Capitol, but um, that seems to get lost in the shuffle. But whatever he did, those were official acts. So Trump is arguing that presidents should have immunity from, from criminal prosecution for official acts. So the remedy is impeachment. If you don't like what the president did, you think the president broke the law, all right, start an impeachment and try to get a conviction of Senate. But you can't tie a president's hands and try and tie down the White House decision-making process with all these claims from, you know, uh, Judge Mercon or Alan Bragg or... Bonnie Willis or whoever, coming from every, you know, highly biased district attorney in the country. Well, that was debatable. By the way, this, what I just said, this presidential immunity issue, this goes all the way back to Watergate and Judge Sirica and the Supreme Court in Richard, in, uh, in Richard Nixon's um, uh, litigation surrounding uh, Watergate. And Nixon was not impeached. He was probably going to be impeached, but he resigned before uh, impeachment was voted on. He was never accused of a crime. Uh, or so he never uh, indicted, I should say. He was accused of a lot of things, but he was never indicted, never convicted, never impeached. Um, but these things were litigated to the Supreme Court during Watergate. We, we were just there, uh, and um, uh, now they're back. Um, it's very likely that the result 
of the trial in New York, the Stormy Daniels, Judge Mercan case, will have an impact on the Supreme Court because it it tends to support Trump's view, which is forget about me, forget about who's the president of the day. Uh, you can't have a president in the executive branch bogged down by all these petty uh, criminal allegations that come out of the woodwork, which this one did. So um, I think the Supreme Court may rule uh, in favor of Trump on that immunity issue, and that may make the whole January 6th case go away. We'll see. But uh, that's that's kind of at the end of uh, the end of this month. So that's a big one to watch out for. Um, the other one is uh, you asked earlier, are, are the, have the Democrats exhausted their bag of tricks? Well, the answer is no, they never exhaust the bag of tricks. If it gets empty, they come up with a few new ones. But they're going to do something even more shocking than what we just saw, which is look, let's look, look ahead to January 6, 2025. So let's say Trump wins the election, which I do expect. So Trump wins the election on November 5th. December 8th, 2024, the electors of each state gather in their state capitals and they cast their electoral votes for whoever won that state. You know, New York will go for Biden and, um, you know, Alabama will go for Trump and Florida will go for, et cetera. Pardon me, Florida will go for Trump. So they cast their votes. Then, by the way, this is all devised in the... Um, in 1787, when you had to like get get in horse and carriage and go to Washington, actually Washington didn't, didn't exist then. I think the capital was uh, Philadelphia, or briefly New York, but you had to go to the capital to actually cast these votes. So if it seems like why does this take two months to do? Well, the answer is you used to have to do it on horseback. But um, but January 6th, 2025, is the date when the electoral votes are counted by the Congress in the United States. Now. The, when I say the Congress, it's the new Congress. The Congress that gets elected on November 5th is the Congress that will be counting the electoral votes on January 6th. They get sworn in before the president. The president doesn't get sworn in until January 20th, but the Congress gets sworn in January 3rd or 4th. Uh, I think I believe the 4th. So um, so you're talking about the new Congress. So who's going to be? We don't know yet. We won't find out until November 5th. But if the Democrats take the House of Representatives, which is possible. I'm not forecasting that, but it's certainly possible. It's you know it's down to one vote, uh, one one seat right now. And they've already said they're going to do this. Jamie Raskin is going to introduce a measure to be passed by the House of Representatives, saying that Trump is an insurrectionist because of January 6, 2020. Um, if you have a Democratic House and they vote that resolution, and Trump is branded an insurrectionist you can't vote for Trump for president as an electoral, quite differently, you can't count the electoral votes for Trump under section three of um, uh, article 14, article, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, under section three of the 14th amendment. So 14th amendment section three says a pres uh, an insurrectionist can have federal office. That's what it says. It had to do with the civil war and Robert E. Lee not running for uh, Senate or whatever, but, it, but it's, it's on the books. Um, so if you and the Supreme Court said the states can't do that. So when Colorado and uh, Maine were trying to kick Trump off the state ballot, which they did for a short period of time, the Supreme Court said, no, the states cannot do that. So that was the end of that little insurrectionist uh, uh, movement. But the Supreme Court also said this case was just a few months ago. The Supreme Court said, but the Congress could that it was not a state power, but it was a federal power. So if the Democrats take the House and they pass a resolution saying Trump's an insurrectionist, even if Trump wins the election, his votes would be disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And then you say, well, then what happens? Well, the answer is the election is thrown to the House of Representatives. This happened twice, 1800 and 18, uh, 1826, uh, so uh, with uh, John Quincy Adams and uh, Andrew Jackson. So... Um, so now let's jump ball. So if you can't vote for Trump, who are you going to vote for? Uh, Nikki Haley, uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, uh, you know, et cetera. Joe Biden would not have, Joe Biden wouldn't have 270, so he wouldn't have enough, but Trump would be disqualified, so you couldn't vote for him at all. So nobody would get 270. I mean, nobody would get 270 electoral votes in this scenario. So you throw it to the House. And there they don't vote by individual, they vote by state delegations. So there are 50 state delegations that get, that get one vote each. So, uh, you know, my little state of New Hampshire is equivalent to California in that scenario. So uh, so stay tuned. So my, my point, Matt, is that 
uh, is this over? No way, because the Democrats will never, never stop trying to defeat Trump. All right. Well, like we said, we've got some months ahead of the election, a lot of fireworks here. Jim, I can say it for all the readership. We appreciate your insight, especially on such a timely issue like this. So everyone at Paradigm Press, we appreciate it. And everyone at home watching this right now, um, we'll be staying ahead of this. Jim will be keeping you posted through Strategic Intelligence, his paid newsletter, and also here on the Paradigm Press channel. So we appreciate it, and we will see you next time.